survive, right? Because you have care for both the government and churches and lots of, you know, humanitarian aid. And a lot of people uh, get the aid that they need, or, or most of it. But in this day, there was nothing like that. You basically, if you couldn't walk, you were in trouble. It meant that you were going to be like this man, destitute, and hoping by hope that he could be healed through some miraculous random healing that happened once in a while at this uh, pool of Bethesda. And interestingly, this pool was made up of five porches, right? You heard it say that? There were five porches that surrounded this, this pool. And I want you to meditate for a little bit on this pool and on this whole scenario, because this is how the fathers see the Holy Scriptures. They don't look at them as technical things, but they look at them as telling a story about something bigger. And even the circumstances that Jesus heals people and leads people along in their Christian life or in their spiritual life, in this case, before Christianity even began. And he leads them along. He guides them along. And the fathers always see this as a teaching for us, right? We see, well, there's a man who's uh, you know, paralyzed, and the Lord heals him. Okay, great. Big deal. Well, the deal is big, because his healing is our healing. His healing is our life. And the Lord teaches through this healing, even to the Jews, because, you know, he's always trying to teach them something, because they're always cold. They always don't want to listen. And I think in many ways, we become like that as Christians sometimes. We don't hear, we block things out, uh, we, we don't want to hear things that rustle us up inside a little bit and cause us to think about ourselves. But this is really what the Lord is all about and the gospel teachings that we try to understand what they're really saying to us. So let's look a little bit closer at this passage from John chapter 5. The Lord comes to the man and he sees him at this these five porticos, which the fathers tell us that these represent the Pentateuch, the five books of the law. And that surrounding uh, the pool are these five books of the law. And the pool itself, of course, is an example like all water in the Old Testament and in the New, are a representation of baptism. That it's a new beginning. <laughs> and the law leads us to the new beginning. But notice what the man said when Jesus said to him this question, do you want to be healed? You know, and this is the big question that we all have to ask ourselves. Do we really want to be healed? Because when sin takes us down, when the passions are holding on to us, it is very hard to escape them. And we have to sometimes ask ourselves, do we want to leave this? Because sometimes we feel comfortable with our sin. We feel comfortable with our infirmity. And Jesus was point blank asking this man this question, wasn't he? Do you want to be healed? 38 years he's been laying there. You might say, well, that's kind of a rhetorical question, isn't it? You know, wouldn't you want to be healed after 38 years? But again, because of the way sin and the devil and the world works, sometimes when we're really feeling like, you know, bad, but at the same time, we kind of fall in love with our badness, you know? 
We fall in love sometimes with the feelings and the sins and the difficulties that we have. We almost take a security in them. And you wonder if this man was lying there and taking security in his 38 years of being this way. Now, the Lord asks him a point-blank question. Do you want to be healed? And of course, the man doesn't even say yes, does he? He actually says to him, well, I have no one, no man, it says, to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. When there's a hope of salvation, he can't get there quick enough. Notice what he says. I have no man to put me into the water. The fathers see this, of course, as Christ. The Christ is the man. He's the man who puts us into the water. He's the one who rises up out of the water as well. It is the Lord here who pointedly goes at this point in time, at this very moment, to heal this man because he needed this great healing. But where are we? Do we want to be healed? Do we truly want God to take us and transform us, to make us new? You know, you lay there for 38 years in one position, what are you going to do after that? Where are you going to go, right? Once we're freed, we have to be ready to move forward with what God has for us. And a lot of times, that's the most fearful thing. What will God do when he takes this away, this infirmity away from me? When he removes this sin from me? When he takes away this passion, when he heals me of this, whatever it is that we have, how will we react? Will we love God? Will we seek him? So the Lord heals him, and he says to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. A very simple little phrase. And all of us have to rise, don't we? Peter raises up the paralyzed man with his shadow as he passes by. And then Peter raises Tabitha from the dead. Remember when Jesus said, you will do greater things than even I have done? And here we see Peter, on the same day, raising a paralytic and raising someone from the dead. Tell me that we're not capable, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to do the same miracles. We are. It is by faith and by love that we heal. It is by faith and love that you send healing out to other people. There's a great energy in prayer. There's a great, great strength in praying for one another. But we have to be faithful to it. We can't just say we do it and then not do it. We have to follow through. Rise, he says to him. Rise. Rising is important, you know. Every morning, if you don't get up, <laughs> the day doesn't start, right? A lot of times we want to lay in bed. We want to stay there. But we have to rise up. And this is a metaphorical rise, right? The rising of ourselves from darkness to light. Right? From death to life. From sin to virtue. This is what God wants us to do, to rise out of the darkness. And then he follows it up with, take up your bed. Take up your bed. The fathers see this, St. Bede, the Venerable Bede, says that when he says to take up uh, his bed, it means to now care for other people who cared for him. It means that when we are down and we have been helped and lifted up, that we need to return the favor, that we need to come back and be the one who cares and ministers to others who are in a similar circumstance. And all of you know this because if you've been through something difficult in your life, you can sympathize greatly with someone who has been through the same thing, right? You've walked in their moccasins, as they say. And when you've done that, you know, you, you understand, you, you can sympathize with them. Take up your bed and walk. Walk. That's another important thing. Walk. Walking with God. That's where we hear this word walking in Holy Scripture, right? In Genesis, it says that God walked with Adam and Eve. It said God walked numerous times throughout the Old Testament. It says that God walked with someone. And even we have this little vision at the road to Emmaus, right? When Jesus is resurrected and he's walking along with his disciples and they didn't even know it was him. 
until much later. But he was walking with them. And this walking symbolizes and represents our relationship with God. Because our relationship with God is about moving forward, right? Walking is about moving forward. This is always what our relationship with God is. It's not stagnant. It's not a non-energetic, non-alive thing. It's living. It's moving. And we always have to be walking forward, right? And we walk forward always in prayer. Always with our minds and our hearts focused on who God is. So he tells the man, rise. Leave your sin. Take up your bed. Care for others. And walk with God. And of course, as usual, that day was a Sabbath day, a day of rest, and the Jews, of course, did not like this, that he was carrying his bed, uh, but the man said to him, who to they asked him, who told you to carry your bed, and he said, I don't know, a man who healed me, and i just doing what I'm told. Jesus later comes to him in the temple, and what does he say to him, but a very important phrase, he says to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. And the fathers tell us that 80% of the time, approximately, the things that we are suffering from are from our sin. When we're suffering from an infirmity or from something, a struggle, it's probably from our sin. The other 20% of the time, uh, it could be a number of other things. And one of those other things that a lot of people also struggle with is the fact that God puts us through things to teach us. He puts us through things to perfect us. He puts us through difficult times to make us holy. To allow us to see ourselves for who we really are. And to totally trust God. Because when we're all fit and we have everything correct and there's no trouble in our life, we tend not to lean on God, don't we? We tend to lean on ourselves. But when there's difficulty and struggle, you now sometimes we might blame God. Why, God, why are you doing this to me? But instead, we should always ask the question, okay, Lord, you put this in our life for a reason. What is this reason? Help me to understand it and help me to be patient. Our saint today that we remember is Saint Alexis Toth, who was a Uniat priest, came to America, and was basically uh, ousted and ostracized by the Roman Catholic Church. And he went to the Russian church and said, could you receive us? And after much study and deliberation and analyzation of really what the doctrines of the church are, he realized, wow, I'm really Orthodox. I'm not Roman Catholic. And he came to the patriarch and all the leaders of the Russian church, and they received him in, not just him, but his whole church. And then after that, 17 other parishes that he was able to bring in to the Orthodox Church. But it was because of his patience. He could have looked at this struggle, this great difficulty that he was facing, where he was basically rejected by his own. He could have looked at that and said, and given up, or just went into hiding. Or went back where he was from. But instead he endured patiently and knew that God had put him in this place for a reason. Imagine the confusion your whole life. He was a teacher in seminary uh, in, in Ukraine. He was a very faithful priest in the Union Church. But when he realized what was really going on and he saw the holy doctrines and saw what he was really missing, then he changed. And it probably rocked his world for a time. I'm sure he was in a great struggle. I know as a priest, when you have your, your things that you know are true get changed a little bit, boy, is it, it can rock you, you know? This last couple of years, you know, we saw this happening even in our own churches, right? The rocking of our faith. But that is what we must go through. We must patiently and humbly endure. And when we do that, maybe it might be 38 years. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever God has for you. 
But God calls all of us to be patient and to be humble, like St. Alexis, who, after this great, uh, has been made a saint. The church recognizes this patience and this humility and this endurance and this desire to change. Brothers and sisters, we have to have a desire to change. And when I say change, of course, you know that's the word repentance. We have to have a desire to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. We have to have a desire to want to live out the teachings of the Holy Gospel. Not just hear about them on Sunday, but live them out in our life in little ways, little simple ways that you can do these things by loving others around you and by loving God faithfully and praying to Him. It's a simple formula, but it's a hard one to do because there's so many distractions in our lives. There's so many people that jump in before us. There's so many people that are pulling us away and calling us out from, to something else. We have to get back to this, this body, this love, this peace, where God is, where he dwells and where he leads us as in an ark to holy salvation. So let's be led by the gospel today. Let's pay attention to the paralytic. Pay attention to those uh, ways in which God uses circumstances in our life to bring about change and healing for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen. Christos is grace. Christos is grace. Christos is grace. Christos is grace.